Thank you all for joining us. We are so honored to welcome Bryce Martin here with us this evening for a conversation with our curator, Kelly Montana, on the occasion of his exhibition, Think of Them as Spaces, Bryce Martin's Drawings, which is now on view in the Menil Drawing Institute through June 14th. Tonight's program is a part of the Menil's ongoing artist talk series in which we invite artists whose works are a part of our permanent collection to speak at the museum. The series continues next month with Allison Janae Hamilton and later this spring with Kate Shepard, Alora and Calzadia, and Joseph Kazuth. As with all of our public programs, these talks are completely free and open to everyone. Thank you to Francie Neely for making our artist talks possible this season and to the Anchorage Foundation of Texas for their very generous support of our public programs this year. We would also like to thank those who have made Think of Them as Spaces Bryce Martin's drawings possible. Major funding is provided by Janie C. Lee and Schlumberger, and our other exhibition sponsors are Angela and William Kennedy, Diane and Michael Cannon, Julie and John Kogan, Carol and David Newberger, the Matthew and Ann Wolf Drawings Exhibition Fund, Eddie and Chinwi Allen, Claire Casademont and Michael Metz, Barbara and Michael Gamson, Diana and Russell Hawkins, Janet and Paul Hobby, Linda and George Kelly, Susan and Francois de Menil, Suzanne and William Pritchard, Leslie and Shannon Sasser, James William Stewart, Marcy Taub Wessel and the Taub Foundation, Nina and Michael Zilka, and the City of Houston. This exhibition is accompanied by a beautifully illustrated catalog, thanks to the Menil's Director of Publishing, Joseph Newland. Books are available for sale in the Menil Bookstore, which is located just across the street and will stay open late this evening for anyone who may be interested in picking up a copy after the program. And now before we begin, please silence your cell phones if you have not already done so. We will have some time for your questions after the conversation. If you do have a question at that time, please raise your hand so we can come around with a microphone as we are recording this program. Thank you all for joining us. A huge thank you to Bryce Martin for being with us tonight. And now I would like to turn it over for further remarks to the exhibition curator and our assistant curator of the Menil Drawing Institute, Kelly Montana. Please join me in welcoming her and Bryce Martin. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. It's so thrilling to be with you this evening in celebration of our exhibition at the Drawing Institute. My name is Kelly Montana and I'm the assistant curator of the Drawing Institute and the curator of the exhibition that's on view across the street. It is my pleasure to introduce Bryce Martin. Uh, Bryce was born in Bronxville, New York and completed art degrees at the Boston University School of Fine Art and Yale University School of Art and Architecture gaining distinction in the mid-1960s with his solo exhibition at New York's Bikert Gallery. Martin's work continues to chart a course investigating, investigating color, space, and line. The subject of numerous important exhibitions around the world, including at the Guggenheim Museum in 1975, Documenta in 1992, the Whitney Museum in 1998, and MoMA organized a major retrospective of his work in 2006. Not to mention that you've had three landmark shows in Houston, Bryce Martin Drawings at the Contemporary Arts Museum, Martin Novros Rothko Painting in the Age of Actuality at the Rice Institute for the Arts in 75, and Bryce Martin Cold Mountain at the Manil Collection in 1992. His ongoing career as an artist is celebrated, to say the least. We're gathered here tonight to discuss Bryce's exhibition currently on view at the Drawing Institute, Think of Them as Spaces, Bryce Martin's drawing. I'm gonna go ahead and start with the text written by you, Bryce, in 1979. 
that gave the show its title, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and read it here. The hand touches more delicately in drawing. There is less between the hand and the image in any other media. Drawing is fine and concise. Drawing is graceful. Think of them as spaces. These are my drawings. And I should comment on it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do we think of them as, as spaces? Or what, what um, was this? So this was a note that you wrote to the curator of the exhibition. Is that right? Or a yeah, statement this was that you write? Klaus, Klaus did an exhibition somewhere. Mm -hmm. Klaus Curtis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, they, you know, they say, will you write something? You say yes. And then the day comes when it's mm -hmm. due. <laughs> you write it, yeah. But, you know, I do feel that. I mean, there is less between what you're drawing with and what actually becomes a drawing. Certainly, certainly. And, uh, I mean, you just take a pencil and it barely has to touch the paper. And you have, you know, you just make that line and it's, it just begins at something else. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, does that relate to the idea of space somehow, of it be becoming something or creating some kind of um, commune between you and the sheet or the viewer and the sheet? Um, yeah, I mean, you after you get it going, it's it's a it's a collaboration, hmm. and uh, I mean, I don't. S sit down with it in mind. Uh, this is specific thing I'm doing. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a setup which I guess is the matrix, <laughs> and uh, I mean there's some sort of structure, beginning structure. But actually, that's just something that's you're allowing it it to lead you, and then you. It, it's it's a conversation. I see. So, and, and just to kind of set up this idea that a lot of your work starts with kind of parameters or rules or rubrics or some kind, and then you apply that and then work from it or start that conversation or collaboration, kind of see where the rules go. And, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and start with our slides here. I'm going to start this talk with something that is very present in the exhibition for those of you that have seen it. but not actually in the exhibition across the street. So what we're looking at here are four monumental canvases that are frequently on view here in this museum, The Seasons, from 1974 to 1975. And these are works that are quite important to you. They were made here in Houston. Yeah. Can well, they were, they were started in New York mm -hmm. and exhibited in this, that show. The Martin uh, Navarro's Rothko show. But before the show, you know, I, you know, I was not really happy with the paintings. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I talked with Mrs. Lee Benil and we, uh, she said, after the show, you can just come back and rework them. Mm -hmm. So well, yeah. so this is I'll, I'll say so this is what this for those of you familiar this is what they look like now I think I have it in here. This is what they looked like then. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I took a um, Navras and I took a driving trip throughout the Southwest, and we went out to Chaco Canyon basically, mm -hmm. and. Um, so a lot of my nature references in the painting come from that, that trip. That trip. I remember thinking about cottonwood trees a lot. Mm. You know, but being from New York, I didn't really think cottonwood trees was my idea of autumn, but somehow it got <laughs> you know, mixed in. So how did, you, how did you arrive at the palette for these? Once you're in the studio and you're kind of processing that experience or that memory? Where, did, where does it start? Where do you kind of begin these colors? I, I, these, I was like very conscious of, of what the shape should be, how, how big it should be. The, the, the idea of the exhibition was an kind of environmental mm -hmm. situation. 
uh, I tend to, to make paintings that are more just focused on themselves. Mm. And uh, there's not a lot of outside, well, there can be a lot of outside reference, but it varies from painting to painting. Uh, but there was some sort of question about this. There, well, I'm gonna go back to, because you mentioned that you were really concerned in those paintings more about the size and scale and their relationship with oh, each yeah. other, so. I did a lot of drawing trying to figure out what the shape should be. And I'd also been coming to Houston to look at the, the, at the Rothfuss Chapel. Certainly. So you're very, you know, and I was like very conscious of how he allowed his surface to, to spread. Mm. And you know, these vertical strokes. And I would come and I would come and stay at the Warwick and then I you know, go over like three different times a day just to catch it in different lights. Mm. And there, I think there was one time where I was getting this strong vertical stroke, which... Um, that really related to the shape of the campus in yeah. some way to start in, and radiate it in. Did you, did you come to Houston that trip specifically for the Rothko Chapel? Was it, was it something... Somewhere that, along the line I mm -hmm. came specifically for the chapel. Okay. Uh, so these I mean, uh, you know, also at the same time I was you're looking at Roman painting. Hmm. Uh, you know, like the same, you know, like I make a pilgrimage to the Rothko Chapel, I also made a pilgrimage to Pompeii. Hmm. And uh, you know, I was looking at those paintings. And this something about the growth of a of a rectangle was was fascinating me. I see. Know. But also, there was a setup where I had the small paintings on the side, so it read. Um, what how how's it go? Autumn. Right. Is there autumn winter? Whoops. Uh, well, it uh, goes. In a cycle. In a cycle. Yeah. yeah goes in a circle. So I want to ask briefly about these though, because these are those studies that are on paper. And so for these ones, there's kind of scoring marks around each of these rectangles here. And wax is laid down in them, and then you worked graphite into those, into the wax. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about what, I mean, was that graphite loose? Was it something that you had prepared, or was it, can you just talk a little um, bit about what working graphite into the wax really looks like? Well, basically, you know, like, with these drawings, I was, I, I, I was turning white into black. Mm. You know, and these are the early days of minimalism, you know, and you <laughs> Is sitting there saying, I'm turning white into, white into black. You know? <laughs> but, you know, you know, one of the, you know, uh, primary pursuits is to how, how you make your material reflect what you want to make. And uh, so I ended up, because you apply so much pressure to the paper, you know, when you're put, applying the um, graphite, I had to use a very heavy paper. So this is like a 400 pound or 300 pound weight paper. And if I hadn't used it that heavy, uh, it just wrinkles up under the pressure. So, um, so I used the heavy paper, then I scraped it down because I, it was a bumpy paper and I wanted a smooth paper. So I took the rectangle that I was working on, scraped it down with a razor blade. Uh, and then after I got the whole rectangle, you know, created. Then I put wax, I used what, what, white beads of wax, and uh, 
rub that into the paper, scrape that down so it, that was nice and even, and then I would go in and start turning the white into black. And I used a number four Eberhard Faber graphite stick. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, you just had to eat. You just have to work it and work it and work it and find it. finally it's like, and it was a, such a pleasure to see these. I haven't seen them for years. Because they, re they really do that in these, in these drawings. I Absolutely. Think later on I get a little lazy. <laughs> they're incredibly, they're, they're physical as objects. And I think maybe part of what you're, what you're getting at is that they, they seem to really be engaging with this concept that you're trying to work through at this kind of early earth stage in your career where they are the kind of the physical embodiment of the plain image they are you know physically this image is on the same level as the sheet and it's something yeah. that you develop in different ways but here it's you know literal it's really it's really there um, the other question I'm interested in in these is that these are studies for the seasons we have a few more these are other drawings that are in the exhibition here, and they're dated 75, so, and the paintings are dated 74 to 75. So did you start working on these halfway through the painting? Was it, was it something come up and you were, wanted to move to something else, or they're just? I think they were just taking a long time. I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I also really briefly want to touch on, so these are, versions of the seasons that are paintings that are in our drawing exhibition across the street. And as you can see there, they're, um, that's, they're oil and wax on paper mounted on four canvases. And they're the same size, they are the same paper that you made these drawings on. Yeah. It's the same paper mounted onto there. So can you, can you just talk a little bit about the status of these as paintings or drawings or their status as studies and kind of how you were working them? No, I, I, you know, they were just smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, I, keep, I keep thinking that they're done on, I had soji screens made and then we mounted the paper on the screens. Uh, I don't know, it just seemed to be something I was doing. I had done other kind of multiple panel mm -hmm. paintings around the same time. Um, and the other thing I'll show is that these are, that's what those looked like, the small ones. That was the first version. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was the first version. So you had two and two on opposite opposing walls. So this is yeah. just putting them together. And, a kind of configuration of where they are now across the street. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I want to turn to... I mean, it's a big deal. This was a, like, it was a big painting. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you it's, know, when it's shown I, you know, here, it's like on really, this wall. Yeah, I make big paintings. But, I mean, it was an environmental... So it gave you... You had some sort of feeling of being surrounded by this thing. Uh, yeah. Well, I think that's a it's a good seg into this series, the the posts and lentils that are part of the the exhibition here. They continue a few things we've talked about, which is working with wax and graphite on our very heavyweight arch paper, and they're also about forms kind of coming together. So these canvases that are they have a spatial relationship with each other. And there's also spatial relationships happening here between positive and negative space. Um, is that? I mean, there's, what, just 10 drawings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one does it one way and one does it the other way. I right. mean, it's like mm -hmm. in, in and out or a real figure ground situation. Yeah. So there's. Uh, I, it, it was. It's very. It was very difficult. Very difficult to do because there's so many edges. You know, you got to you, you draw the edges, and they have to be a certain way. And I got had had these things going, and finally just gave up and put them in a drawer, and came back to them, 
I guess a couple of years ago because we decided to put him in the show. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and so there was a surprise for me. It is as though I finished him yesterday, and then you know because they had been away for so long. Right. Exactly. So they're, they're, the post and lintel is one through 10. The first one starts with the graphite just delineated. It's all white. The last one is you've done total blackout with this graphite delineation still there. And so they're mirror images of each other. So four yeah. and seven, it, except, you know, shown here, mirror each other. They were, and you'll see up there as well, the date they were begun in 1984, which is kind of the last year you were working with these canvases abutting each other. Yeah. working with ideas of ancient architecture, post and lintel. And I'm really, I'm, I am interested in what brought you back to them in 2019. What did it, what did it take to finish these last year? <laughs> I hate what to did go, you, what did you pull out of the drawer? Know, what was there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I just, I just wanted to finish them. I mean, it was a, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I didn't like the idea of them sitting in a drawer. You know. And also, you, you, you want to see it. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I'm much more selfish about this. I, I don't want I don't, I, you know, I'm not making them so everybody else can see them. I'm basically, basically making them so I can see them. <laughs> and, uh, But also, it was like kind of I have been working with this posts and lintel situation, uh, which you know, uh, I mean, people have said they they relate to like, you know, I go I go to Greece every summer, and uh, so they made it though as you know this is based on you know ancient Greek architecture, you know. And these things are around, these kind of influences are around, and uh, maybe they were based on ancient Greek. I, I wasn't thinking about that. But it's the same thing, like, I, you know, I look, look, at, look at some of the cold mountains, or the, uh, whatever, what the... The letters? No, the... The uh, windows, uh, the studies for the seasons. Ah, the seasons. I look at those, and you know, I tend to when you when you work, it's almost like a mantra. You're just you're thinking. When I did the Cold Mountain paintings, I was reading the Cold Mountain poems. You know, like there's something that. Uh, there's that kind of outside inspiration. Uh, and this is what I really consider my subject matter. Yeah. I wandered off a bit on that, so I never like, yeah. <laughs> Well, to have these, this, I mean, so this exhibition is the first time you've really seen them all installed in their sequence, framed. Right. Was there something kind of revealed to you in seeing them or something that you, you kind of discovered why you returned to them? What, what's kind of your first impressions of, of seeing them together and, and kind of being in that space? I thought I, they would have, they would make a stronger impression on me. Hmm. And What surprises me is that the, these groups, and I don't really sort of plan groups, they sort of end up, they evolve into being groups. And uh, that's so I really like seeing that whole aspect. I, I mean, any one of those drawings can be taken totally out of the context that's in here. And uh, still, as far as I'm concerned, remain valid. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I would say one of the one of the challenges and, and pleasures of installing your art is when you're working with drawings and drawings that emerge as series. Uh, you know, I remember you telling me that they, you know, they are 
remarkable works in and of themselves. They're independent, they're forceful, they're valid. But in series, you told me they need each other. And yeah. I really, you know, I, it was, um, that, that was important to you, that nothing could be arbitrarily taken out. They're numbered, they're meant to stay together, yeah, even yeah. though they're, you know, unique and, and individual. Oh, but I thought I just said the opposite thing. <laughs> yeah. I it's, mean, it's both. I mean, it's it's both. It's what? I think it's both. I mean, they're they're yeah, opposing yeah, things, but I think so. they're both of those things. Yeah. So one thing that I found interesting in the exhibition coming together is the posts and lentils share a gallery with these works, the Mirabella Addenda, and these are works that you. <coughs> made while caring for your daughter and they're named after her and can you tell me can you talk a little bit about why they're addenda yeah i mean um our first daughter mirabel would wake up for two o'clock feeding she would get fed mm -hmm. and then i would take her we had a big closet i would take her into the closet and I had a rocking chair and a stepladder and a little pad. And I just would hold her in like the football grip. And, uh, and, I, and then I drew these drawings. Uh, and, um, and as I worked on the drawings, like you start, you, you start the first drawing and then you get as far as you feel like going and then you go to the second drawing. And I mean, I had this, someone had given me a pad of Indian handmade paper. And that, you know, like you go to all this, you, you, know, you talk about getting the black waxy surface, this, the paper demanded a certain kind of touch. And, uh, I was drawing with these Alanthus sticks, and uh, you know, so and that's there. There's a, another. There's a good. There's the Mirabelle drawings, uh, and these are all the, the addenda are the drawings that never fit into the first group, mm -hmm. and I, you know, took them out and reworked them, and they became this group. Uh, There's a very Rothko situation happening in these as well, particularly that middle one that's that's shown up yeah, here. Yeah. yeah, I didn't realize that these were in. That you said it was a pad. They were all together. Yeah. Well, I you know, with each. Got it. Yeah, I <laughs> tore it out of the pad. I see. Because yeah. you, because you do some of them you keep together. Like some pads or notebooks, you keep together while you're working, and then yeah. take them apart later. Is there, is there a certain moment when notebooks come apart, or workbooks, as you call them, come apart? Oh, this is all these... <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> this are these horrible stories, you know, like, uh, I have a book that I just uh, took apart because it had something to do with, like, making a show. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, It, 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 was, it was quite recently, and I, you know, the show, the Saint Laurent show. Mm -hmm, that went to um, Paris. <clears throat> went to Paris. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I always carry a book with me, so wherever you are, you can draw. And, you know, that, Yeah, that book, I, I had this one book and I've been working on it for about three years. I figured it's finished. Uh, and then this opportunity came up to show it. So I took it apart and showed it. And taking it apart was like, like traumatic. You're carrying this thing around and it begins to, look, it's almost attached to you, you know. And, uh, so I took it apart and then framed them up and showed them. Uh, why am I? Because I was asking about when when you decide to pull notebooks apart or when you decide to um, kind of commission them or yeah. have them made or 
Yeah. A lot, you know, some, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I work, I guess I work a lot that way, you know, is uh, one after another, after another, after another. They stay together, they come from a certain time or place. Uh, and, it, you know, it's just it's sort of part of the reference of the, of the drawing. Certainly. Yeah. It's, just, it's fascinating to see them apart and think that for three years that you couldn't have had that experience of seeing them together in that way. You couldn't have that whole experience. Yeah, because you know, it's what, always yeah. one after another. Exactly. You know, and you're like, you, know, you have no idea what they're going to look like side by side. You know, and, uh, uh, and that's what I did. But, but with, with the book I took apart, I had them make, we've, we've published a facsimile edition. So it's because they reproduce perfectly because, you know, the, the book's this big mm -hmm. and you just photograph it. And, 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 and nowadays... <laughs> you have a number of facsimile books that you put out. Is that part of kind of dealing with the, the trauma of taking them all apart, that you have them kind of made and put out in the world together? Because you've done it with your, you've done it with notebooks and this recent one with your gallery and really outstanding version that's an actual workbook that's just drawn. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was the first one of those that you did? A facsimile notebook that you had been working in? Um, it goes way back. Yeah. You know, I mean, to you know, monochromatic drawings and mm. stuff like that. Uh, I've never really, you know, I've never really considered it like a thing, mm -hmm. you know. So. Well, we're going to move to a group that you've made mention of already in this talk. And these are the Cold Mountain Studies that were first seen here in the 1992 exhibition that we made mention of. And these are drawings that you made based off of poems by Han Shan, and you kind of borrowed the structure of the poems to begin these drawings. So I have, I do have an image in here, so you can see that's a version of a Cold Mountain poem by Han Shan, which translates as Cold Mountain, with the Chinese on the left and the English translation on the right. So you can get a sense of that understructure that begins these drawings with the marks and five down and couplets across. Yeah, and I, I had this situation where I was with one gallery and left and, two, and went to another one. And the one I went to fronted me some money. So I just took the money. <laughs> and started doing these drawings, you know, which is not what I was doing when they originally gave him the money. <laughs> and, and, uh, but it was also a chance for me to, I was, had become very interested in Chinese calligraphy. And, uh, but at a, at a, very early point, I thought, if I got, I'm going to be interested in this, but I'm not going to try to learn how to do it. I wanted to know, to know more about the other aspects rather than what it says as words. And, you know, like the energy that goes into the actual performance of the, the, the drawing. Um, and this was another book. And I, and I carried this book, and yeah, and then it went down. Oh, it was the the, the coal mountain show that came here. Mm -hmm. uh, took it apart, and these these were in it. Uh, so part of what you were talking about is when you're talking about kind of the energy. Is that calligraphy is really one thing that makes a calligrapher successful is being able to endow the strokes with kind of the thing it represents. So it kind of has this sense of, you know, nature in them, really. Is that part of what attracted you to calligraphic mark making? Well, 
I really liked was get, the more you learn about it, the, the more complex it really gets, and how you know it. Um, And it's it's very broad, you know. So it's like very spiritual. It's very this. It's very that. Uh, and you know, these these are just I was just like trying to work it out. How can I do it? What am I doing? You know, and. Uh, because these are drawings that are often talked about as being this seismic shift in your career. You know, we looked at these more monochromatic yeah. earlier and that this was this moment where you really took a leap of faith and tried this new kind of mark making and put it out in the world. Do you well, getting back to my switching galleries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, I would, you know, and I, and I took this time where I had money um, to figure out what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it took me about a year, two years to get something that was close to what I thought I wanted. And this was part of it. I was doing this, you know, and then when, then when it got to that point where I felt a certain kind of confidence, I thought, you know, I'll try it on a bigger scale. So, these paintings, or these, turn, do we have it? Mm -hmm. We have some paintings. So these are versions that, that you made into paintings? That were yeah, the, and so these paintings, like, oh, I forget the size. Um, <laughs> um, I don't think we have the, we don't have the dimensions up there. But they're pretty big. Yeah. And. Um, but what's fascinating about these is that you've, you've talked about them before, is that you wanted to get that fluidity, that improvisational quality of the drawing into the painting. And I think what's interesting about this, this series, you know, taken together, taking the drawings and the paintings together, is that you have a work like this, take the drawing on the right, for example, where you've made all these, you've made these black marks, and you've gone back in with this white that kind of subtracts or erases and let's air back into the sheet. And you do that as well in, in the paintings to some degree. So I'm really interested in this kind of slippage or elision in your vocabulary between, between drawing and painting. And can you, can you talk a little bit more how the drawing finds its way in the painted form? Well, I was starting with the basic grid that we were showing in the other drawings, mm -hmm. in, in the little drawing. I would start it like that, and then, you know, just work back into it. And what, what I would do is I had a kind of skeleton, and then I would start joining different parts of the skeleton mm -hmm. into a more, <coughs> a more unified, less linear thing. And then, uh, the white came in basically, you know, just as correction. And, but then at a certain point, I noticed that the, the correction was really making a, a ghost image. So, so it was um, sort of the, the beginning of the kind of complexity I, I was looking for in the paintings. Was there any moment for you in making these where you had any concern about, you know, we made mention earlier of this concept of the, of the plane image, about how the image always refers to the plane. And here you're making lines that in some instances do have this figure ground relationship. So at, w at what point did you feel like you were kind of on a, on a path that brokered that synthesis? Well, the first, the one on the left, is that left? Mm -hmm. That's called Path. Mm -hmm. And that was the first painting in the group. Uh, the, the, you know, I have this idea about the plane and, and the image. That's what painting is. I mean, you have this flat plane, 
you create something spatial. Uh, but it does, I am interested in the magic that occurs between the plane and the image. And I used to vociferously object to situations where um, that's violated. And now that I'm older, I feel I wasted a lot of time worrying about this. But, but, but I have a lot of trouble with collage because collage, it, it, a lot of its space comes from structuring space. And um, it's, it's usually, a, it's a physical structuring. So you don't have that flat, mm -hmm. that flat thing. And I keep thinking somewhere in, in, in between these two things, the plane and the image uh, is where I want to be, or I, I'm, I think it's some sort of territory. Yeah, everybody, you know, like they say, painting's dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, and I always think this, this is where it can go, it, or this is one of the things it can do. And, uh, and you know, I'm still sort of hacking away at it. I mean, I got four paintings, I'm just starting. And I, I keep thinking, well, I want more, it, more intuition. I want to get some human thing out there. Uh, but, but then again, you know, you've got to do it. <laughs> Give it a try. <laughs> So these are works in the exhibition, the 15 by 15s, and they start with the same kind of grid that the, or the same type of way of thinking that the Cold Mountains start with. But these start with 15 marks across and 15 marks down. And for me, these drawings are a unification of sorts of a lot of different things that are happening in the exhibition. You have the calligraphic line, you have very bold color, you have this lovely green, and you have this predella of sorts across the bottom of each of these sheets where the page is left, the sheet's left blank, but you can see the drips, the smudges, the timekeeping of, of the drawing. Um, can you talk a little bit about finding your way back into all of these different ways of working across your career in this moment in the recent past? Um, I started working, you, um, I'd always avoided the square because it was perfect. And uh, so I was just like made, used, worked with slightly off square shapes and stuff like that. And, and then I said, well, why don't you try a square? Or, or ba basically what I do, I was working on a, sit uh, a situation and I took a shape, I think it was just like a canvas I had around or some arbitrary situation. And I just measured, you know, across the top and then measured down and I made a square out of the rectangle I was working on and I've been doing that ever since. And this is about maybe one of those green paintings. These ones here? No, the other one. The first the one? <laughs> oh. oh, that was 2017. Yeah, I did a whole group of paintings that, you know, well, and these, these are basically studies for the paintings that I'm just about ready to start in the studio. Uh, and I'm painting them on canvases that I had prepared to be part of some uh, commission. The, uh, the Glenstones? 
Oh, yeah. I did this big painting for the Glenstone. And, you know, Martin marked off this. Oh, what I had done was I had done these, prepared these canvases as optional canvases for this commission. And I never got around to doing these because I had to concentrate on the big one. And uh, so now this is what's next. So. Also, I like the fact that there was a photograph of the sun on the front of the Times a couple of, a couple of weeks ago, and they looked a lot like this. <laughs> I should say what's notable about the Glenstone Commission is that they also really pull from the seasons. They really yeah. are, are a return to that, um, the canvases that we, that we have here. Yeah, what it's called? Oh, the Moss Sutra with the seasons. The seasons, yeah. The seasons, yeah. yeah. I love moss. <laughs> yeah. And I really like this situation you have here with the uh, the rocks and trees that's absolutely beautiful would you change you're a but you you're kind of a you arrange rocks and things in your garden is there anything that we should adjust here on the campus why don't we go ahead and ask <laughs> you know, i collect scholars rocks um and that all comes out of the whole calligraphy thing you know. right well, actually, I, I just, I'll, I'll pause on this one. This one is one that's related to this set that we just looked at that's 15 by 15, zero. And this one is, it's not in the exhibition because it's, for you, serves as kind of this index of sorts or kind of way yeah, of mode yeah. of understanding the series. I'll end with just, a, I'll end on this, actually, on this slide with just a couple questions about this. So a couple more. The way this is installed in the exhibition is that we do create this grid, so it becomes, all these sheets come together to become this very large work in the show that becomes, you have to have an interaction with it that's an interaction that is at the scale of painting, I would say. So you've talked previously in other, in other interviews about your ideas for how one should view a painting which is you take how tall the canvas is and you, stay that far, you stand that far away and look at it. You double that, you look at it, and then you be sure to get in close, look at the sides, all these sorts yeah. of things. So it's this, it's this interesting moment where you kind of have to do that with drawings in the show. But I say all that to set up Is what it... it oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What's your recommended method for viewing a drawing? Uh, I don't, uh, number one, get as close to it as possible. I mean, it's just wonderful seeing people dealing with drawings and you've got a drawing thing here that sort of promotes it, like you can get up and you're right on top of it and it's, it gets you back to, almost to that experience of it being made. Mm. Uh, and people say, you know, about my stuff, they kind of say, well, I, uh, how, I don't know what to look for, and I say, just pick a line and follow, <laughs> you know? And, hope, you know, hopefully you begin to disappear or you begin to, mm -hmm. you know. So that's my suggestion about looking at drawings, <laughs> yeah. And with that, and we're going to take a few questions from the audience. So if you have, if anyone has a question, we're just going to take a few here. And please, again, wait for the microphone as it comes around. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Kelly and Bryce, for a beautiful exhibition and a very generous conversation. Um, Bryce, you mentioned about the Mirabel addendum drawings that the paper demanded a certain touch. And you've also talked about your relationship of drawing to painting, but I was curious to hear about your relationship of drawing to printmaking, uh, because I know you're one of our, the, the great printmakers of our time. 
And I wondered if, um, as you approach drawing on a print matrix, if that sort of dictates the way that a line is drawn, if there's some quality about making a mark that uh, interests you about printmaking particularly. Well, I used to think of uh, printing as, uh, I'd start like a project or a group usually started out somehow with like a small drawing, an idea, you know. Then you make it a little bit bigger and then you make it bigger and then you finally work it up to some very finished uh, situation which then goes on to become a painting. Uh, etching used to be my place between you know drawing and painting, I liked it because it was physical. But I just haven't been making etchings. But it's, I'm living in the country; it's too, so complicated. Yet, you know, the, uh, so I've got a whole bunch of unfinished etchings sitting in a room I call the etching room. <laughs> yeah. No, I. I at Yale, you, know, you didn't major in painting, you majored in painting, printmaking, and something else. Uh, so etching's always been a, a part until kind of recently. Is there another question? Um, so, this one, I'm asking advice uh, for other artists. Um, as, as you moved through your career and people started to like your stuff and give you attention for it, how did you figure out how to not let that ruin the process for you? Like, how did you figure out how to constantly reinvent yourself? And it seems like you enjoy it. Like, that's what it looks like. So how did you do that, and what kind of advice would you give to artists who are starting to get attention that they're not asking for? I didn't really hear, hear too much. Uh, I find it a constant struggle. And from the minute I started wanting to be an artist, I always felt it was a threat from the outside because you're, you're involved in things that the, basically the society just isn't involved with. And it's you know, your job to keep it clean and to deal with truth. Even, though, you know, I mean, it sounds so uh, Pollyanna-ish, but uh, I mean it's true. You, you, are, what you make, you're responsible for, and yet at the same time, it's not yours. And uh, and it always seems to me. So first, first they try to starve you, yeah, <laughs> and they, you know, then there's this, then there's that, and then you know. It, a, a certain kind of acceptance can be very stultifying. Uh, I mean, I think I think about it too much. Uh, but, you know, it's part of the gig, you know. I'm curious about the increased use of color in your work, which seems to give the work more weight, more substance. I'm sorry? I'm curious about the increased use of color yeah. in your work, which seems to give the work more, more, more weight, more substance. Can you talk about that? Well, at a certain point, you know, like, you know, I, was, I did a lot of monochromatic, you know, near gray paintings. And uh, then I thought, well, this, needs more complexity, so I added another color. And it was like that thing about turning white into black, you know, like, you know, if you're painting monochromatic paintings and then suddenly you add another color, that's a huge step. 
you know, and uh, but you're always pushing yourself, you know. So then, you know, I I, I got onto this thing about uh, of pushing the color, eliminating white, eliminating black, you know, only having straight color, you know, mixes, and uh, I'm not. Right now, I'm not worrying about that too much. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, still pushing the color. I think we'll take a couple more questions. Um, Mr. Martin, um, Mrs. Demineau once told me she asked Victor Bronner how he knew when a painting was totally finished. And he replied, you feel it in the hand. And I'm wondering how you know that you can release yourself from it. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. She, she's asking how you know when a, a work is finished, in her lovely words, when you can release yourself from it. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know. I mean, it just, you know, I used to say it, it, it's finished when a truck pulls up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's not that far from it. Uh, no, but there is, I'm, I'm working on a painting now that I've been working on for, God, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how many years. And it's in, in our house, it's referred to as the nemesis. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I, I, th I think I'm on to it, I'm getting, I'm getting close, you know. It, it just, ha it, it happens. Um, And it's not necessarily because you can't figure out anything more to do to it. It's um, more complicated than that. I mean, it, it gets to the point where like, you can't figure out anything more to do to it, so you do more to it, and then you, I mean, it's, it's part of the working process, and uh, it very rarely comes up and just says, I am finished, you know. Very rarely. Usually it has to sit around for a long time and uh, it then it declares itself. Uh, what motivates you to paint and draw and did that motivation change over the course of your life? I think, I, you know, I wanted to become a painter because I liked bohemianism. <laughs> and at a certain point I decided it was not my, um, my thing to play football. Uh, and I just, you know, I decided I wanted to become a painter. And set, set out about it, you know. Uh, and, you know, we used to stand around art school in our desert boots and loden coats. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like a anything, you could, anything you could do to make you feel more like, like being a painter because you didn't know what it was. <laughs> and, uh, and but, but then, uh, <laughs> Then, you, then at a certain point, you're stuck in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know. But also, you know, you're, like you're stuck in it, but you're like, because, you know, you're just always learning stuff. And uh, they're the essentials. And, you know, well. So I think we're going to take... If, if, I, if I may, one last question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, just, just one last question, and an unfair one in a way. Is there a last word? So the competition between Delacroix and Angra, one said, it is painting. The other one said, it is the line. Do you have um, a willingness to make such a statement like that to that audience, or am I being uh, premature and unfair? Thank you. I, you know, I'm not thinking that way right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I get nervous when I think I've made too many sort of absolute decisions and, uh, uh, so I won't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Bryce. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. The bookstore is going to stay open. It's open now if anyone's interested in taking a look at the catalog for the show or seeing some of these beautiful facsimile books Bryce and I made mention of. So please enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you.